All right. So we are here today with uh, Mr. Rob McEwen, and um, it is July 22nd, 2015, in uh, Toronto. Uh, the interview, as usual, will be William McRae. So we'll start with a few basic questions. So could you please state your full name? Robert R. McEwen. And your age? 65. And where were you born? Toronto. And um, as a child, what did your parents do for a living? My father was in the investment industry, uh, broker, fund manager. Um, my mother, had, early on, was a physiotherapist and then a housewife, and someone who inspired her children to reach, to uh, test boundaries, to pursue their artistic side. And she also volunteered for hospitals and art galleries. And um, you were saying pursue their artistic side. What uh, Did you have art, uh, interest in uh, the arts or anything like that when you were a child? Or? Absolutely. A lot of drawing, sketching. Um, in fact, I expected to be an architect from grade 2 to grade 12. I, that was where I was going. Um, my father, on the other hand, he introduced me to the market when I was 10 and 11. He had me charting stocks and then in, I invested my first investment when I was 12. What did you invest in? It was an insurance company. Okay. And uh, it went up ninefold in 18 months. So it was a pretty good investment. Um, yeah, you got a pretty good allowance. Yeah, well, <laughs> I made it though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, at the age 12. <laughs> yeah, $200 became $1,800. So wow. it was in a short period of time. And I thought the market was like that. But that was, um, that's why I call that my worst investment because. It made me it think spoiled you. That it, that's what happens when you put money in the market. Yeah. It took about 30 years to repeat that. Oh, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. And um, so other than drawing, sketching, and uh, investing, uh, what, uh, what other pastimes did you do as a child? Um, pretty much played every sport there was. Um, became a very active water skier, um, competitive water skier. Um, like recreational racing and downhill skiing. Um, Same here. So, um, there was always something to do. I like being active. Okay, good. And um, as, as we'll go into it further uh, in the interview, um, you, uh, you eventually uh, worked uh, with the natural resources industry, uh, but was there a passion or even just a, an interest early on in sciences or engineering or anything of the sort? I always had an interest in um, good math skills and uh, science technology always intrigued me. So I always was looking at how things were made and building. Okay. And um, what about your, uh, your education? If, um... uh, high school, I was in a boarding school north of Toronto. Um, and then I went to uh, spend a year in Europe and then came back, went to Western, did an economics degree. Um, or a BA with an economics major, and then worked for three years in the investment industry, then came, went back and did an MBA, uh, focusing on finance and marketing. Was it always, um, I mean, as a, as a child, was, it, was that going to be your path, finance or um, No, architecture was going to be. And, yeah, and okay. Then, um, and I guess my year in Europe dissuaded me from that. How so? Yeah, my marks weren't that good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, and I thought, where am I going to go? And my father was in business, so all right, business. Okay. So um, started off to go in undergraduate program and then decided um, to do an MBA as opposed to an undergraduate. So, okay. So Western for the undergraduate and Schulich for the uh, graduate. And there I was president of the Students Council and advisor to the deans. Um, and a small business consultant as well. Okay. And um, throughout your, your years in university, like, did you enjoy economics or? Yes, there, economic history more. Did you, like, what, I'm, what I mean is, it wasn't a mistake to have uh, not tried for architecture and, and get yourself into something completely different? It's curious. It, for many years, I thought I'd abandoned architecture. And uh, one day, many years later, after I was building Gold Corp, I looked back and I said, well, I'm, I'm really doing financial architecture because I put a number of companies together and created 
a new entity. Okay. So I never really left it, it just got pushed aside. Okay. Different type of architecture. Yes. And um, so what was your first, uh, what would you consider your first official job? My first official job? Oh. Let's say well, after, after school, after university. Um, after undergraduate, I went and worked for my father's firm. And he, um, I did research and sales, um, and that was for three years. And that was in the investment industry, and it was focused on the gold market, um, gold stocks, gold bullion, um, a lot of foreign gold stocks. So that was exposure and I guess gold and libertarian views on government. Um, and the value of gold and the debasement of currency were all dinner conversations growing up. Um, so it was sort of, in a way, that aspect of mining was infused into my cells as, okay, I, yeah. as I was nourished. So the interest the for, for gold, at least, was already there. Gold and, and an illustration of the, the discoveries of the, and the uh, the wealth it creates, not only for the individuals involved, but for the country as a whole. Okay. And um, did you have at that point uh, a mentor or someone who you look back and really affected you or shaped kind of the path you took? Over my career, there would have been, there were several people that contributed. Um, I suppose there was a professor, a business professor at Western that um, asked me to think about student politics and um, I'd never really given it any thought, but I ran for undergraduate president at Western and came in second, but I was a late entry and I thought, well, if I'd worked a little harder, I could have become, would have become president. And then when I went and did the MBA, I found myself being attracted like a light to a moth, or, you know, a moth to a light. Yeah. When uh, I asked for a class rep and I got elected and the elections came up the next year and the president came along and said, well, I'd like you to run for president. And there are a couple others, but I figured uh, I'd jump in and I won that and then was president of the graduate student council as well for the whole university. Um, and then a couple of others, and I just found myself moving in those directions, mm -hmm. uh, where rather than, you know, you, you step forward and take the responsibility and you can control your life better. You can set the agenda rather than having someone else set it, set for, it for you. you. So, um, so uh, the first three years were in the investment industry, uh, I guess I graduated. 73. Um, by January of 74, they had just legalized gold in America, made it legal for American stone gold after 30 years of it being illegal. Um, gold hit $200 an ounce at the beginning of January, and two years later in 96, or 86, 76, sorry, <laughs> getting the years mixed up. In 76, it was down to uh, about $92, $96 an ounce. Two years later, and at, at that point, all the gold stocks and everything had dropped away. Um, and I went back to school and then came out, um, took a trip that went around the world in a converted army truck, drove out of London and drove through Europe and then through the Middle East and the Far East. Um, and it was a real eye opener. It was like opening up the National Geographic and stepping into the picture, and as you did that, you threw away your watch. Yeah. And you started seeing the world as it really is, rather than what it's in North America. Yeah. Um, and then after that, I joined Merrill Lynch. I, um, when I graduated, I, I found that if you could market yourself, and there was only one student council president, there were only 12 small business consultants at school. There was only one advisor to the deans. Um, I, I view myself as a packaged good, and it's on a shelf. And in the supermarket, you want to be basically three to four and a half feet above the floor on the shelf, 
and you want as much shelf space as possible so that people naturally reach for you. And that was how I looked at positioning myself going through school, that how could I become a compelling hire? So um, there were a number of companies that came along and they said, we'd like you to start right after school. And I said, no, I'm taking the trip and I'd like to start six months later. And a number of them said, well, our program starts right away. And I said, oh, okay, well, I'm not working for you. Uh, and then Merrill was good enough and they said, sure, we'll hire you. And uh, I worked there for two years and then I uh, left them um, and uh, joined my father and bought an interest in his firm and then eventually bought him out. Um, what was his firm called? It was um, Sardoff McEwen Securities and then he bought into another firm that became uh, McEwen Eason and then it be, there were some people who came, they were, their brokerage firm was bought by the Bank of Montreal and it became uh, Deacon Morgan McEwen Eason, and today it's Dundee Securities. Okay. So, um, and at the time, did he also uh, invest a lot? In, what, was there a lot of gold? Or? A lot of gold. Yeah. Okay, for him as well. Yes. And so, um, and there I met a number of people in the mining industry that there were prospectors, promoters, and I got looking at them and thinking, some of these guys are really good at nailing deposits and say that's going to be a big one and they did become a big one. There's one gentleman, Murray Pezum, who was quite a promoter um, and he a very colorful individual, um, maybe a little exuberant at times, but he, uh, he put Hemlo on the map, he put um, LaRange in Saskatchewan, SK Creek in BC, I mean this guy just seemed to see projects and some of them grew into quite significant deposits. And that told me that there were still more deposits to be found in the world and there was still more wealth to be created. And so after uh, 18 years in the investment industry, I decided to take a closed-end investment company that I was running and jump into a hostile takeover battle and do a broadside on the hostile bidder by basically getting 51% of the vote by offering a higher price than the hostile was offering. And we had to go through courts because the hostile didn't like it, but um, we ultimately won. I thought I would continue doing the financial architecture in the company, structural, and let the operators run it. And four months down the road, I decided that wasn't a good idea. And so uh, within the, a year of buying control of two mining companies, I took out the boards of directors of both companies, took out senior management, and stepped in as a CEO and, and built a new management team. Why, uh, why not um, those people? They didn't think the way I think. I thought they should. Uh, they weren't going, I'd made a large bet, and I had the wrong team. They weren't ready to change with you? They wouldn't change. And uh, the head of operations basically went, mining is all about drilling, blasting, mucking. And the only way we're going to improve our profitability is if Mother Nature's kind to us. Um, I said, no, it doesn't work that way. Drilling, blasting, mucking at a profit. If we don't operate at a profit, we shouldn't be in business. And that, I went through three or four heads of operations until we got people who thought the right way. Um, and what were the name of those two companies? Uh, Dickinson Mines and Wharf Resources. Okay. Um, basically, there was a, an eight-year period where I took a, a string of five companies and did three corporate restructurings to create Cold Corp as we know it today. No, not quite as we know it today, but it, as it was in the early 2000s, and then I added uh, Wheaton River to that, 
and stepped out. But before that, just going back a bit, I, my first exposure to mining came uh, right after, uh, it was a summer after first year university, and a, a friend of mine at university came from Sudbury and he said, you know, you really, the summer, you can get a good summer job up in Sudbury. Uh, they pay well. So Buddy and I hopped on his motorcycle and we went up to Sudbury. Almost froze to death getting up there in late <laughs> April. But we got up there and they put us into a one-week training program. Um, and then there was a test. And I remember uh, as soon as my buddy wrote the test, he was gone. He didn't want to work in Sudbury. Oh, no? No. So he went back home. And he's and, the one who brought you up there. Yes. <laughs> uh, so, but I remember they put us through the training program. They gave us a couple of hours to write a test. I finished the test in maybe 20 minutes. And um, as I was walking towards the front of the room to hand my test in, and, and the instructor had, you know, the supervisor had left the room, but uh, a fellow stopped me and he asked, um, what's the answer to this question? And it was about putting a, how you uh, prepare a stick of dynamite for a fuse. And the question was, do you use a spike or a wooden uh, plunger? And uh, I thought about it for a moment, and then I said, spike. And that's the wrong answer, because a spike can create a spark, and yeah. this little dynamite can blow up in your hand. Um, but I figured if he, could, if he hadn't learned that in the first week, I didn't want to be working underground with a guy like that. So <laughs> I said, spike, and walked on. I don't think he got hired. Um, at, at, while I was working underground, they, uh, my, my first job down there, the first task I had to do was often they had backfill spills where they're, they're pumping material back in, basically sand back into the mine um, to fill the voids that have been created. Mm -hmm. And these pipes frequently broke and they'd fill the ditches. Um, so the students would be given shovels and they have to dig it out. Of um, course. So that was the first, and then they... What kind of mine was it? It was in, in Sudbury, Inco and Nickel Mine. Nickel, okay. yeah. Okay. And I were even... Well, I guess the first time we went underground, we were walking down this spiral ramp from one level to another, and I guess the truck drivers, they'd see a group of students, so they'd want to give them a bit of a, a jolt. So that the truck would backfire as it's coming down the ramp, and everybody just thought the place was caving in. <laughs> um, and you didn't have much room between the truck and you. There were little holes cut in the wall that you'd tuck in, and the, oh, yeah. the, brush, wow. the truck would just brush by. So that was mining, and it was heavy equipment, very steel, hard surfaces, loud noises, lots of dust. And sometimes smoke. Um, so did you like that or no? Well, I looked at it and I thought, gee, you know, you could do a lot of these things better. You don't need these heavy steel pipes. You could use plastic. You could. And I wandered around. I was given a lot of opportunity. They had me uh, drilling on a jack leg and then they had me um, driving the truck that delivered the shovels to the other students um, when there was a spill. <laughs> then they put me on a large rig, which uh, a jumbo drill, and trained me on that. And at the end of the summer, they asked me if I'd, if I'd like a scholarship and uh, to study mining. And I said, well, thanks very much. I've already covered off my university expenses um, going forward. And I don't really think mining's in, in my life. And I found that, when I look back on it, really ironic. Yeah. Back then, because I've and you bought made a career into a mining, in yeah. the mining industry. So, um, in the investment industry, uh, research, sales, investment banking, uh, ran a number of mutual funds that invested in gold bullion and gold shares internationally. Um, I controlled, controlling shareholder of a Toronto Stock Exchange member firm. Um, and then, one day I, uh, I brought some partners in. They were, I'll call them boat people. 
they were coming from a, a bank purchase of a large brokerage firm and they didn't want to go to the bank. Um, our business had high payouts, uh, much more freewheeling and attracted large producers. And I realized then that we went from 20 people to 120 in a year and it happened to hit the market on a very strong upward move and my dividends were greater than my annual dividends were greater than my invested capital which I went well oh, so it's a pretty good idea to have a lot of people working for you um, and I remember having before we moved I had to crawl over two desks to get to my desk every morning and evening uh, to get out uh, because we just packed in yeah. there but it was all about making money and not having a lot of extra expenses. Um, and when the market went down, you cut your expenses quickly. When the market went up, you could take some more on. Um, so I'm looking at the, the mining industry, having observed a number of people that had made a fortune, lost a fortune, made a fortune, lost a fortune. That's, uh, those are two things that mining and uh, finance have in common. Yeah. I mean, a, a lot of times they're, they're both interconnected, but uh, they're very, it's a very fluctuating business. Both yes, on, both very sides. cyclical. Yeah. So I, had, um, I was attracted to it, and I thought it'd be interesting. I, I viewed the mining industry, the probability of making a big discovery is very low. But the possibility exists. And in a number of industries, that just doesn't happen. Um, so, as I said earlier on, I jumped in to this hostile takeover battle. I'd watched the company um, for a number of years that was subject to the hostile bid. And I actually had a deal that someone reneged on where I was going to become a large shareholder of that company. Um, and I sat with one company trying, thinking of making the bid, and then I switched to another company I controlled and we made a bid. Um, but I. Going into the industry, since I was, I'd never operated, been in an operational capacity, I asked a lot of questions. And I was always asking, why? Why do you do it this way? And they said, well, they give me this answer. We've always done it this way. And I said, but does that mean that's the right way to do it? Well, what other way is there? So I had the advantage of being an outsider in an industry that was very, for the large part, rooted in its ways. Um, there was a great deal of inertia, and I really don't like inertia. And I don't like answers that are, we've always done it this way. I guess some people might call me a shit disturber. <laughs> Disruptor. And um, so I'd ask the question. If I didn't get the right answer, I'd keep asking questions. And then I'd want to make changes. And since I was chairman, the CEO, and the largest individual shareholder, um, I could, in effect, make those changes. And so Gold Corp, when I, or the Dickinson mine that I bought, um, had been going since the late 40s. It had, a, um, it had been starved of capital for about 15 years. Um, the company had diversified into industrial minerals because it didn't like the union. There was an aggressive union, uh, steelworkers chapter up at, or local, up there. Um, it was high cost, and since they hadn't invested for about 15 years, it was nearing the end of its life. But right next door was the Campbell Mine owned by Placer Dome, and it had been the recipient of more than $100 million in the same period of time. It was quite profitable. It was non-union. Um, and so I looked at my first, the first thing I did when I became CEO uh, was to go call up the union, their head office here in Toronto, and say, could I come in and talk to you? I'd like to talk about your experience with other models of cooperating with management. Do you have any of them? Because from what I understand, the relationship 
that our union and management have with is terrible. And there have been a number of strikes and they were very aggressive. Uh, and the union said, I remember walking into their office and everybody's looking at me and saying, we don't have CEOs of companies coming up to talk to us. Uh, I said, well, that's okay. Let's make it a start. <laughs> and that started a dialogue with senior management of the union. And at the mine site, every time I went up, I'd have dinner with the union executive just to figure out what, what are their concerns and, uh, you know, share with them my view of the world and, and the economics. And we developed a pretty good dialogue. But at one point, I mean, the price of gold was falling through the 90s. And in uh, 86, or falling through the 80s. And in 86, we'd gone through, we'd had two collective agreements already. And uh, it, sorry, I'm confusing. In 96, we had, uh, had, by 96, we'd had two collective agreements. It was in 1989, I bought control, 1990, I stepped in. Yeah, that makes sense, because you had said you were in the, for, you had been in the finance yeah. industry, business for 18, 18 years. years. Yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, I had said to them, um, the gold price was down. Our, I think the gold price had got to about 380, and uh, our cost of production, cash cost, was 360. So, fully loaded cost was above the uh, gold price. And I said to the union, it's not going to work. And we, uh, we tore up the collective agreement that had been established over since the union was there in the early 50s, um, which they didn't think was very good. And I said, look, we're in business to make money. If we don't make money, this mine's going to be shut down. Um, I see a way of keeping it going by changing our operating relationship. And first and foremost, you have to understand that we're in business to make money. If we make money, we can share it. If we don't make money, we can't share it. And the community loses as well. Second, safety is not the exclusive preserve of management. It is a mutual responsibility of labor and management. And they found those two thoughts rather, um, they were opposed to them. And then I said, in terms of technology and training, I'd like to broaden the skill set of everyone so they have better opportunities if they happen to go to another mine or even within their own mine. And they didn't like that training. And then when we rewrote their collective agreement, they said, we're going out on strike. And the strike lasted 46 months. It was one of the longest industrial strikes in North America, the longest in the mining industry. Um, and during the course of that strike, I got death threats. My home here in Toronto, we replaced all the basement and ground floor glass with bulletproof glass. There were two occasions where the Metro Police SWAT team showed up at the house. Um, and it was very tense and it was sad watching the community shrivel because of the lack of economic activity. Uh, we didn't, when the strike started, we stopped producing gold and I said, uh, I just stepped up the exploration budget, said to our geologists, now you have an opportunity to explore this mine. Uh, you have a free hand, but once the strike's over, you won't. So I want you to run at 150% of what you think you could run, and because this is going to be a short time period. I said, I don't know how long the strike's going to last when it started, but I I have a feeling it could be longer than we seem. And each time we went back to the table, normally the union will, they'll have high demands and management has low offer. And the lines will come together, intersect somewhere out in the future. In our case, the union was here, we were here, and it looked like a parallelogram. Each time I went back to the table, I offered them less. The gold price was lower and they were costing me money. 
And they found that a little unusual. Um, when we had the death threat, it was uh, we just signed a deal, a bot deal with um, RBC Dominion Securities for sixty million dollars, and I called. Uh, we just signed it, and then right after we signed it, I got a uh, a letter came in, and it was from the mine, and they'd received it, and it was a death. It was a death threat, and it basically said if um, if you think you're going to break us, you're not, and if, if you want blood. We'll give you blood. Everybody who helps you is a target. And at the bottom they said, remember Yellowknife. And that's where the same union was involved. And nine people were killed when oh, they really? planted a bomb oh. in the mine. Now what I found, I, I found the, the death threat a little unsettling, but also humorous. Because they gave me 30 days to correct my actions. But they didn't date it. So, you know, well, when does it start? So, um, so we'd had this signed deal for $60 million, a bot deal, where the broker gives you a check and takes your shares. And I called up the chairman of the, the brokerage firm, firm, Tony Fell, and I said, Tony, I just got this death threat. And I've decided I'm going to run an ad in the local paper. I'm going to run this letter. I'm going to publish it with a few deletions to um, respect words, maybe. civility. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to put a $35,000 reward on the head, a bounty on the head of the person who wrote the letter. And what kind of bounty? $35,000 no, no, cash. But, but uh, to, to oh, it, say who it is, essentially? To yeah, find out? Yes. Okay. And I said, this will not another threat is what I was no, asking. Not no, a counter threat. No. Well, it, in, a, in a sense, <laughs> whoever wrote it now had if someone could turn them in and get thirty-five thousand dollars into an account. So we, uh, I, I, when I was talking to the broker, I just said, the investment banker, this is going to go in the local press. It might get some larger press, and that might affect the stock that you've just bought from me. So I'm going to give you twenty-four hours and give you the opportunity to back out of this bot deal. And, they, and I said, we're going to be financing in the future, and uh, obviously now is not the time to do it. So they came back the next day and said, well, we'd like to back out. <laughs> we don't have an obligation. Um, and they then said, but we'd still like to market you. And I said, well, that's ridiculous. You don't go marketing after you pull the bot deal. He said, oh, no, there's good demand. I said, all right, I'll humor you. So we went out, we marketed it, and they came back a week later. We've got strong, strong demand. And I said, Tony, at what price? Well, it's at a lower price, obviously. I said, I'm only selling stock at this price. I'm not selling at a higher price. So we didn't do a deal. Six months later, we raised $90 million at 50% higher. Um, the the interesting thing about Red Lake was that you just kept pushing it. Um, we got to a point where our engineering staff said, well, we have a large enough resource to find that we can put it in production. And I asked them, well, how much, what's the size of plant? And they said, well, based on what we found, we'll build this. And I said, well, we've been finding gold at a higher rate than that. And if that keeps up, you're going to build too small a plant. Yeah, but we're only going to build it based on what we have. And I said, but if you look at the consistency at which we're finding the gold, there's a good chance we'll find a lot more. And I'd rather have a 10-year mine than a 20-year mine. Get the money out of the ground faster. Uh, so we ended up building a mine that was bigger than what, that was bigger than justified based on what we found, but we found much more. Um, so. At the end of the day, uh, we decided to build. We built a very modern plant, uh, wired with fiber optics, webcams all underneath. You could connect anywhere in the world and discuss with management and the operators a problem in 39 places in the mine. Um, and this has been an old mine that had grown in increments and was very inefficient. So. Uh, 
it was nice to see that technology coming into the mining industry. Then the union came along and I said, well, we've got the mine built. We had a camp on site, um, contract workers, and that um, we had to deal with getting through the picket line all the time. I guess a couple other things that were unusual. We went up one day, the directors, to talk about shortly after the strike, I don't know, well not shortly, a, couple of years, a year or two later, when we were going to build a new mine. And I said, well, let's get all the union members and their spouses and their significant others to come to a meeting where we can explain. Uh, the union tried to get everybody to boycott it. But the night before we were up there, uh, before the meeting, we'd finished a management meeting and I was walking down the main street of the town, Bomber Town. And I was looking at a head frame that Campbell had built. I said, we're going to build a new one of those one day. And this is around 11 o'clock at night. And half a mile down the road is our mine entrance. And earlier in the day, I'd asked my, our mine manager to drive me by. And he said, no, I just got a new truck. They'll probably throw a stone at my truck and wreck the paint. <laughs> So I had that in my mind and I said, I'm going to walk down to the picket line. Now, um, I thought, as I was walking down there, I thought, are they going to kill me? No. Are they going to push me around, beat me up, leave me in the ditch? Unlikely. Are they going to yell at me? Quite probably. Um, so I walked down. This is a small town in northern Ontario after 11 o'clock and I arrive at the gate. And they have their bonfire going and their guys with their pickets on. I say, hi. I say, hi. They don't know who I am. Yeah. And, uh, and they have their trailer. And out of the trailer comes one of the union executives. He goes, he says, they were, do you know who this guy is? And before he could say it, I said, well, I'm the guy that has you on strike. What? And... I said, yeah, well, what are you doing here? I said, I just wanted to talk. And they went, oh, do you want a Coke? Um, and we talked for about two hours, of batting mosquitoes. Um, and the next day, everybody in the town seemed to be talking about that. And, and we had our meeting in the uh, Legion Hall and just described our plans going forward. Because I like making sure that everybody is is what, be very transparent in what we're doing. Um, and so it, our union ex experience was very different, but I think you, you just have to look at all parties. And the union had always been um, successful getting their way in the past. Um, Previous management said caved for whatever reason, and I just felt it was important. And I'd have to say, at one point, I was in and out of the labor board because the union protests, and I'd go in. We'd always take them to court every time they broke the law, but the police didn't want to enforce the law because they were unionized as much as they should have. Um, the labor board was very sympathetic to the union. And I remember one day, 46 months down the road, the union came along and the head of the union said, Rob, could we go out for a, drink, a coffee? Just the two of us. And sure. So I get there and we sit down. And he said, this has been a terrible strike. I said, what do you mean? You've destroyed our property. You've given me a death threat. Um, and I haven't produced anything. It's costing us over a million dollars a year. Okay. I said, I want to accept your last offer. And we offered them cash, oh, a slight increase, and shares by way of stock options. And at first they were really confused by the stock options. They thought they had to put up money to come back to work. Okay. Um, but they didn't. And he said, we're not, I don't think we're going to have a good relationship going forward. So we're going to leave. I said, I beg your pardon? We're going to leave? Yeah, we're going to decertify. I said, oh, all right. He said, why don't you think about it? Here's my home number. 
call me tonight if you'd like to meet tomorrow and I'll get our lawyer and myself in your office and uh, we'll sign a deal. So I'm like, oh, that sounds interesting. Right after I met with him, I called up our labor lawyer and our labor negotiator and spoke to both of them and said, guys, this is what I've just been told. And they said, that's impossible. This never happened. I said, well, that's what it is. Be at the office at nine o'clock. And they came at nine o'clock and I asked Harry, Harry Hind, could you explain to my friends here what you told me last night? So, well, we're going to leave and we'll sign an agreement and we're never coming back and we'll sign, give you a letter saying we're never coming back. All right. So <laughs> he said his piece and my guys were looking at me like, what's next? I went, you have five minutes. We went into the next room. He signed the deal and it was done. And I said, well, how are you going to get the union? local to go along with this. I'll deal with it. So he went up to the mine site, got the local executive to sit down and said, it's been a long strike, you fought hard, but um, this is a deal that you've got on the table and you're going to accept it. And if you don't accept it, there's no more strike pay. And they went ballistic and they said, we're going to sue you. We're going to sue the U.S. headquarters of this union. You've had us freezing our butts off for four years almost. Yeah. And uh, you just pack it in there. Uh, there were 180 men that went out on strike, and we took back 45 after we trained them and selected the ones that had the right attitudes. Um, the without, mine went without a union. Without a union, the mine went from producing 50,000 ounces a year at $360 cost to producing over 500,000 ounces a year at $60 cost. With less men? Uh, we increased, we hired others. Okay. We, we just, we were hiring on the basis of skills and attitude. Uh, but there was a 60 fold change in the economics. The options we gave to all the union members, including the ones that didn't come back, within the space of two years were worth $30,000. Um, and I'd have to say, a proud moment for me was to see our new mines starting up. Uh, and exceeding all expectations, getting a payback in a year and a half on our investment, um, and watching Red Lake come back to life because it had wilted uh, because of our strike. And in the next two years after our strike, Red Lake was one of the most actively explored districts for gold in the world. Um, and part of that was due to something else we did called the Gold Corp Challenge, which was an internet contest yes. where we basically ask about that. asked the world to tell us where we'd find the next six million ounces of gold in our mine. We gave away all of our proprietary data. Um, well, how did that work? What was the, what was the deal with that? So, so you wanted to find out new areas that should be mined Yeah. for gold specifically? No. I believe that there was much more gold to be found in the mine. Okay. And I hoped there was much more. So we were going along um, exploring and each year we were finding more gold. Um, and when we were making, looking to make a decision on how big a physical plant we were going to, a new one we were going to build, uh, I wanted to know if we were scaling it properly. So I went to our head, our chief geologist, and said, "Steve, how much more gold? How much more gold is there here?" And he said, "I don't know." I said, "That's a lousy answer." He said, um, "All right, how long is it going to take you to find out?" And he and Jill both went, "We don't know." Another lousy answer. So I'm thinking about this. I said, now, "How do you get on top of this?" Every time I would go up to the mine, I'd walk around the exploration department. I'd talk to most of the geologists, and, and I found that some of them had different ideas than the people managing it. So, uh, well, maybe there's some ideas that haven't surfaced. We should have a brainstorming session. So I asked the geological department, exploration department, put on a brainstorming session for two days. And I said, here are the instructions. I want you to talk about all the ideas you haven't shared and all the ideas that your boss shot down. 
So I was going to be a fly on the wall, and this session started. It didn't take very long. Within about two minutes, after the head of exploration started the session, I said, time out. Would you mind sitting down? And I got up and I said, I'd like to hear from this individual. He had the least tenure. Oh, the little guy. He went, yeah, well, he was new. He was experienced, but new. And he had a dissenting view. And I said, I'd like to hear about the last idea your boss shot down. And in this room, where they're both in the room and everybody else, there were about 14, 15 of us in the room, you could see, you just imagine this arc of electricity going across the room. And it almost went, if you say that, it was the boss saying, if you say that, you're fired. And I sensed the tension, so I just sort of ran into it and said, I'd like to put it on the table right now. If anybody threatens anyone with firing, the person making that threatening statement, I'm going to fire right now, and they're going to go out this door. There's some nervous laughter, and about a, three weeks earlier, I had fired one of our managers at an industrial mineral place. Um, so they knew it wasn't an idle threat. Our industrial minerals fellow, we had an operation in New Brunswick called Havelock Line and had been going since 1938. The fellow running it, they'd come in, all our managers would come in every quarter, and I'd just say to them, uh, give me uh, one sentence how you feel. And this fellow said, I feel like the Maytag man. And he went, Maytag man? Is that the guy in the commercial with, he's a service man and he's got his phone in front of him, he's got his elbow here and there's cobwebs between his elbows and his arms, his bicep and forearm? Yeah. I said, you're telling me there's nothing you can do to this operation. It's been going since 1938. There's no new markets to open up. There's no efficiencies. There's no training. He said, yes, yes, yes. I said, that's impossible. And I said, Len, see that door? You're going out the door, and you're never coming back. And so it was just, there's always something to be done. It is not sit still and wait. So the guys in Red Lake were well aware that it wasn't an idle threat. Anyhow, so the brainstorming goes on. Mm -hmm. People have shared ideas. It's really getting exciting because there are a lot of new concepts surfacing and the group is seeing the potential. And at the end of two days, they run out the door full of energy, new focus, and uh, excited. I walk out the door and I think, well, that was good. How do we make it better? And I thought, well, maybe the next one we have, we'll invite government geologists, our retired geologists, why don't we invite the guys from next door at Placer Dome to come in? Because they know about this area as well. I'm thinking, well, that's not a bad start. And then it's like a seed germinating, this seed of a thought. And I kept thinking about it. Um, and I thought, hmm, probably. I mean, we're in a greenstone belt. There is, and there's a greenstone belt on every continent. So maybe there are experts on other continents that have different ideas. But how do we get to them? So I had that thought in one part of my brain. The other part, I um, belong to a business association which is called Young Presidents, uh, YPO. It's an international organization. And they put on educational courses at schools all around the world. So I had signed up for one at MIT in Boston and it was a course on information technologies. And I thought, if any in industry needs information technology, it's the mining industry. So I enrolled in the course, and there were 40 of us from around the world, and they went from serial entrepreneurs from California that had started up and sold three or four companies to complete neophytes. There was a guy from China that had 600 music stores, and he wanted to expand from there. Wow. Um, so we had the dean of the business school, the dean of the artificial intelligence, and the dean of their information technology hitting us with ideas for a week. 
And in the second day, right after lunch, uh, one of them started talking about Linux and open source code, and that's when the light bulb just exploded, and I went, there's the template I'm looking for. So after the course, I ran back home and said, okay, we're going to take all of our proprietary data that spans 50 years, we're going to throw it up on the web, and ask the world to tell us where they think we would find the next six million ounces of gold in our mine, and we're going to offer prizes of half a million dollars. Okay, so that's, I was wondering how that would work. And um, we launched it at the PDAC in 2000. Um, and it really had some interesting elements, because I'd always gone up to the mine before that, and I'd say, do you have a model of this mine? And they said, well, we, we have several models. We have one for the upper level, and one for the lower level, and one partially developed for the middle. I said, why haven't you put them all together? And they said, well, they're all on different standards. And we went, well, why don't you put it on the same standard? Well, that takes more time and work. And so when we announced this contest, they went, well, we're not ready. And I said, well, you have six months to get it ready, the database. And then our head of exploration went, what happens if the market doesn't agree with how we've calculated? And I said, well, um, you think this is a world-class deposit, right? You think that you're doing the best way of analyzing it and assessing it, right? So that won't be questioned. Um, so there was a lot of nervousness around it. And then I said, well, maybe someone's going to take us over if they get all this information. I said, well, if someone's taking us over, they're going to pay a premium. You have options. You're going to, hire, you're going to get a higher price. If they don't take it over and we make a bigger discovery, your career is going to be pretty good because your name is going to be on the front of this report and we're distributing it to every mining school in the world. And we were, we were a little company and I remember going to meetings. What were you guys called at the... At Gold Corp. Oh, okay, Gold. so it was Gold Corp. Yeah. Okay. yeah, when Dickinson and Wharf got merged into Gold Corp mm -hmm. um, during those three corporate restructures. But, um, you know, you had to sell people on the benefits. What is the benefit? What's the benefit to Will? doing an interview. And in this case, it was Jill and Steve, and I said, look, your name are going to be on the front of this report and be circulated around the world. This is a very important discovery, and we're doing something very unusual, and you're going to get a lot of profile. It's going to open doors. And if we make a discovery as a result of this, share price goes up, and you have shares, your options go up, and your career is guaranteed creates all sorts of opportunity. So they were uh, doing that. And just before we launched, all the geologists went, because it was sort of a blind contest. We didn't give any of our own targets. It was just pushing boundaries. And I think in the Gold Corp Challenge, it took us a, a small Canadian mining company and put it on an international stage. It totally differentiated us from the rest. People go, what is a mining company doing with the internet? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Business Week named us as one of the 50 most innovative companies on the web um, shortly in about 2003. Canadian Business named us as one of the most innovative companies in Canada. Um, there have been a number of books where we've been featured in it, um, Wikonomics, uh, the world is flat, a whole bunch of other things. And it's been very exciting in that, and it really shows that the biggest gold mine in the world lurks between everybody's ears. And if you can connect those thoughts, you can create very powerful opportunities. So, um, and, and it paid off? Like, um, yeah. Were there outsiders who did give you good information and uh, they, Absolutely. they got the reward? Absolutely. We had, it was um, much like a sporting event. We did, had semifinals and finals. Oh, okay. Uh, we selected a panel of international judges, um, South Africa, Australia, um, US, Canada. And there were five judges, and they looked at the submissions. There's a Bob Mason out of, he was a professor emeritus um, at Queen's, to help structure this. And he contacted five people and said, these guys 
they're really excited to be a judge I've spoken to. I, I remember calling up Bob and I said, I've got this idea and I'd like to bounce it off you. And uh, he said, well, he listened and I said, well, I'll call you back in a couple of days and see what you think. He called me first thing the next morning and said, Rob, I haven't slept all night. <laughs> I've been on the phone talking to people all around the world. I have your panel of judges for you. This is the most exciting idea I've heard in my life. And all the other judges the same way. We just, this is just off the, ch off the charts in terms of... Yeah, pretty, of pretty unorthodox uh, when it comes to mining. Yeah. So uh, they were charged with picking their top 25 um, submissions and then we got them all together because they all had different 25s. There were some common factors and they picked a group 25 and we paid each uh, group um, $10,000 and then and so there were, that was a quarter million and then there was three finalists and we said refine your submissions there's another quarter million to be had. The judges came up with a first, second, and a tie for third. So I increased the prize money rather than divide it between the thirds. Um, the first two, the first prize went, it was a collaborative effort between two consulting firms out of Australia that had never been here. Oh, okay. Um, none of the contestants had ever been to the mine. And, but these two consulting groups found themselves sitting in a reception room in Australia going to talk to a large mining company and I guess a meeting had backed up and they found them both looking at each other and one guy said, I think I have a, there's a contest in Canada's I'd like to enter, but I can't do all of it. And the other guy said, I could do it. So they went together on it and uh, after the contest, <laughs> revenue, they were coming back and forth to Canada so much after they were declared the winner, that Revenue Canada said, you have to ta file taxes in Canada. <laughs> um, second place, um, Marco Day went on to, he was hired as president of one company, he's gone on, founded a number of companies since then. Um, third place, there was a, a Russian, and he said, deliver my money to London and don't run any ads in Russia. <laughs> um, and the, the first, the winner, the winners, their submission was a very sophisticated computer graphic, 3D computer graphic. And when I saw it, I almost fell out of my chair. I, when I picked myself up, I got on the phone and I called three institutional investors and I said, can you give me five minutes of your time to each one of them? And that afternoon I went out and showed them to them. They'd heard the Gold Corp story for a number of years, but had never bought. And after seeing them, at the end of the day, they, there was 15 million, orders for 15 million shares of Gold Corp that went in that afternoon from those three guys. Uh -huh. uh, because it was just so clear. Uh, and it, it just further encouraged innovation in Gold Corp and empowered everybody to look for new ways of doing things. And what was the rule for you guys? Could you only select the first place? Uh, like the area they gave you? No, there or, were... Or did you have... There were a hundred and... Were you allowed to access or, or capitalize on the submissions of all of the candidates? On everybody. Okay. Yeah, um, the, the candidates signed off on any proprietary rights okay. uh, when they joined the contest. And it was... Um, you, they generated, that group of 25 generated 110 exploration targets and 50% of them were brand new to us and we hit when we drilled 80% 80, 80 of them. So very high hit rate, no one had ever visited and it just goes to show you could get a lot of people looking at a problem statement. Um, there was no way you'd ever be able to go out and talk to 25 different consulting firms and get them to look at your problem statement in the time frames that we did it. Mm. So the Gold Corp Challenge is, it's led to all sorts of other things in my life. And so it was a lot of fun. Um, it, so just a couple of summaries. Yeah, sure. Can I, uh, I'll go with one uh, yes, other please. 
question, we'll switch it up a little bit because we've been talking about the, the mines in Canada, but now maybe switch to mines outside of Canada. Um, looking, back at, at, looking back at one of the recent unfortunate events. The robbery. In, uh, yeah, the robbery in uh, Mexico. Yes. Uh, how, if we could talk a bit about that, but how challenging is it for Canadian companies um, to operate in foreign, often um, crime or drug plagued regions? Well, there's cultural difference. Um, criminal elements are more visible there. Uh, security is something that we don't think about in Canada, have to think about, usually. Um, but down there, it's something you want to keep in the back of your mind and sometimes move it right to the forefront. It's a different setting. Uh, the political system works differently. Um, there's opportunity. You can, you can often get permitted faster than Canada. Um, they've taken the best of our systems and incorporated it and sort of leapfrogged ahead of what we do in Canada. We've become overly regulated and the time frames to bring projects on are very, very long. They're, they're ridiculously long. Um, for a country that wants to build employment, and see a technological base build, we should be getting off our ass and getting the government to move a lot faster. Um, but that's another part of the world. I would like to say that um, mining has allowed me to uh, support medical research. Uh, my mm -hmm. wife and I set up a center for regenerative medicine and stem cell research in, in the largest research hospital in the country. Um, out of that have come a number of things. We have an annual prize we give out internationally, $100,000 a year to, for the most innovative work in stem cell research in the world. Uh, it's been going for five years now. Our first recipient was a Japanese researcher that was, uh, found a way to take a skin cell and reverse engineer it into a stem cell, and a stem cell can make any part of your body. Um, he received that five years ago. Two years after he got our award, he won the Nobel Prize for the same work. Oh, yeah? Yes. So I'm trying to figure out how we get some more Nobel Prize winners at yeah. the time. You could be the next producer of Nobel Prize winners. Yeah. Well, it'd be nice to be a predictor in there. Yeah. Um, and there's, um, there's a leadership program at a school that I went to north of Toronto that's produced some very skilled high school students, entrepreneurial, um, and uh, a lot of leadership and entrepreneurial skills being given to them. They're running a lot faster than most people. Um, I think there was an Order of Canada, which was, yes, yes. Which was uh, an incredible award, a very humbling. One of the, one of the highest. So, and you also received the uh, Queen Diamond Jubilee Award recently. Queen Diamond Jubilee, and yeah, there's, there's been a few along the way. Um, Is that mostly for your philanthropy? So, because uh, a lot in, you've given a lot in healthcare and also in education, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Um, Mining Man of the Year, I was pretty happy with that. Um, but it was, it was the work of a lot of people that contributed to that. I, I think it's a great industry. Um, I think there's a lot of land mass in Canada that needs to be developed. We, if the government wants to do something, it should be putting in some infrastructure, maybe to assert sovereignty in the Arctic. We should be building a couple of roads north to the Arctic and then crossing the country. Uh, we have to resolve the First Nations issues quickly. Otherwise, um, when they can build a 59-story building in China in 30 days, we can't even get to it get to one meeting in 30 days. Um, we're way behind the curve in terms of that. Um, but uh, right now I have to interrupt the meeting. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Greatly appreciate it.